Hello, this is Professor Stephen Eshaban here. I'm here to talk to you a little bit about um, shells, the periodic table, and an introduction to atomic orbitals. So I'll start off here. Uh, if you can just uh, remind you of the connection between shells and the periodic table. Here's the periodic table. Here's the first row, which has one shell. Second row has two shells, and so on. And uh, what uh, next topic I just want to tell you about then is that shells are actually made up of things called orbitals. So inside each shell there are subdivisions of the electron cloud that are called orbitals and an orbital tells you where you're likely to find a particular electron. They come in lots of different sizes, orbitals do, including one that looks like a sphere like this one here on the right, uh, which is called an S orbital. and uh, you know, this is just a schematic way of showing that there is an electron that's in that orbital, okay? Uh, in this case, uh, there's only one electron in that orbital, and uh, since the maximum is two, as we'll see in a moment, uh, we would call this a half-filled S orbital. Now, if there's two electrons in an orbital, then we draw two arrows pointed in opposite directions, and so here's how we would describe a filled S orbital. And there are lots of more orbitals on every atom. Most don't have any electrons, and we would just call them empty orbitals. So there is uh, this idea that a maximum of two um, electrons can fit into any given orbital uh, is the first part of a principle that's called the Pauli exclusion principle. So uh, let me flesh that out a little bit for you. Um, the idea is that every electron is actually said to be spinning and it uh, turns out electrons can only spin in two directions, like, you know, counterclockwise and clockwise, if you like. And uh, we'll just call one of those spin up and the other one spin down. And here's the deal, is that electrons, if there are going to be two electrons in the same orbital, they have to be what we call spin paired, which means that they have opposite spins. So that's why I put two opposing arrows here in this uh, S orbital. Uh, it's a filled orbital with spin paired electrons. Uh, just as a counterexample, this doesn't happen because they have the same spin. That's not allowed by the Pauli exclusion principle. Uh, neither does this. Same problem. And here's a bigger problem that we've tried to cram three electrons into that orbital and that's not allowed by the Pauli exclusion principle. So I'm just going to take you for a little tour uh, over some of the elements in the various rows. So back to that diagram, here's, a, here's the first row or period of the periodic table. Uh, it turns out the first shell only has one orbital. It is an s orbital. It has a name. It's called the 1s orbital. And therefore, the first shell has a maximum, according to the Pauli exclusion principle, of two electrons, provided they're spin paired. Now, since that is the only shell, and it is the outermost shell, because it's the only shell, then those electrons that are in that orbital, that 1s orbital, are called uh, valence electrons. They get a special name. Second row. Okay, um, so here I've drawn uh, two shells, and uh, I've drawn here, there's the inner shell. That's the first shell. It still only has one s orbital. It has two electrons, but now because that's not the outermost shell, uh, they get called core electrons. And uh, here we are in the outermost sh shell, at, which is true of all of them, uh, in the second row. Um, turns out that shell has four orbitals, which means it can hold a maximum of eight electrons, again, to the, due to the Pauli exclusion principle. Those are now going to be called the valence electrons because they are in the outermost shell. And the electron, the orbitals that are there, there's one 2s orbital, that's a sphere, and then there are three 2p orbitals that are shaped like these double dumbbells. Now, um, just a kind of a point, I don't know if you notice about this, but when we are talking about going, thinking about a 1s orbital and then in the first shell, and then now we've gone to the 2s orbital in the second shell, uh, they look the same, they have the same shape, but um, generally sh the orbitals get bigger uh, as you get to higher shells, and in fact, that's why the shells are bigger. That's because their orbitals uh, are bigger. All right, um, I also just need to have a little caveat here that depicting shells as concentric circles is a little bit misleading 
because, uh, again, I, or I'm going to go to neon here, which has two electrons in the first shell, eight electrons in the second shell for um, a total of 10 electrons. So there's two here, two here, and then a total of six here. Those are the three p orbitals. The fact is they're all piled on top of each other, so it's not really concentric rings. It's really a big old dense ball of, of electrons. Um, but it's still convenient to write them as those concentric circles. All right, let's go to the third shell. Uh, third row, I mean, of the periodic table. Uh, that has electrons in shells 1, 2, and 3. So all the electrons in the first and second shells are now going to be called core electrons. The electrons in number th shell 3 are called valence electrons. And uh, uh, they are, once again, it's a, now a 3s orbital. That 3 refers to the shell, just like the previous ones did. And uh, now we have 3p orbitals. And, uh, and so for a total of um, 8 more electrons, and you can count two, four, uh, uh, and so on. Um, and uh, so here's another point. Uh, it's really to kind of keep your 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 uh, yourself organized on this. I recommend that you copy this general order energy ordering diagram into your notes and memorize it. And it's energy on this axis. Here's that first shell with that, which has a one s orbital. Here's the second second shell which has those four. Here's the third shore, uh, shell that has uh, also four or orbitals. We're going to ignore those guys there for the moment. And let's see. Oh, well, and there's an idea that uh, we've used so far but haven't named. It's called Aufbau. And Aufbau is the mental process of assigning electrons to the lowest available orbitals while honoring the Pauli exclusion principle. So the result of that is this kind of a shorthand called an electron configuration. And here, the electron configuration, uh, we would just call it 1s with a superscript 2. That means there are two electrons in that 1s uh, orbital, uh, which is helium. So a math, pseudo-mathematical way of saying that would be the electron configuration of helium is 1s superscript 2. Now, Aufbau usually results in the lowest possible electron uh, atomic electron configuration, something like this called the ground state, because it is the lowest energy uh, state of the atom. Um, that's not to say that other configurations are impossible. They are certainly possible, but they all get called excited states. And I'm mentioning this because um, back in the 1800s, uh, Heinrich Geisler, uh, 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 Geisler um, put together this sort of uh, this instrument, uh, which uh, consists of a tube. It had some various gases in it. He was able to apply voltage to the two, um, two uh, electrodes on either side and then discovered that when he did that, it would glow. Okay, and you're kind of familiar with this because neon signs, uh, this is basically the neon gas that's in, in, a, in a Geisler gas discharge tube. Now, not all the light that comes off in those situations is visible to humans. Uh, some of them, uh, some of the photons, some of the light that, that, that comes off is, uh, is, is in the infrared range, which we can't see, and some of it might be in the ultraviolet or the X-ray range. I want to talk a little bit about how that happens. So here's back to helium and its ground state. And uh, here's just that, that same diagram. And so here's helium just sitting there as ground state electron configuration. But now we're going to zap it with some with some voltage and what happened was you can see that that electron down here got bumped up way upstairs to this 3p orbital so now its new electron configuration looks like this 1s1 3p1 okay now it's an excited state so it doesn't stay there uh it will that electron was there and now it might drop down to a slightly lower uh, orbital, which in this case is a 3s orbital, so that's its new configuration. And, uh, and when it does so, it emits a little flash of light, which we're calling a photon. Now, the color of that emitted light, I mentioned, isn't always in the visible range. It totally depends on the energy gap from where the electron was to where it's going. So if the energy gap is between 1.8 and 3.6 electron volts, which is a unit of energy, the emitted light is visible to, to humans. 
And there's lots of gaps possible, so there's lots of colors of light that you might get out of a, out of a Geissler discharge, too. Now, we can alpha-bow all the way up to neon. We can say, um, all right, so uh, helium had two electrons here, but neon's got eight more electrons to its element number 10, so it has 10 electrons, so we could pop two here, and then a total of six there. And so if you want to think about what the ground state electron configuration could be, you could pause, write it down, and that is what I get. The same the electron configuration of neon is same as helium, followed by two electrons in the 2s orbital and six electrons there. Now we could even alpha bow all the way up to argon. So we could say, okay, argon has 10 more electrons because it's element, um, sorry, eight more electrons because it's element 18. And if you want to think about what that might be, all right, I think it's going to look like this. It's going to look like the same as neon filled uh, core there, followed by a couple of electrons in that 3s orbital and then six more there. Let's see. The next orbital up in the diagram is after argon. There's a 4s orbital that's in the fourth shell. It can hold two more electrons. So that would be elements 19 and 20. And by the way, we're here, there was argon, and then we're at potassium and calcium. Uh, 19 electrons and 20 electrons. You could probably figure this one out. Um, but there's potassium. It looks just like argon with one electron in that 4s orbital. And calcium's got two there, uh, electron paired. Let's see. Um, the 3D is next, because you can kind of see here, but I'm still going to reference it to argon. In other words, uh, there the next set of orbitals is a set of five uh, D orbitals. This is what they this is what they look like. And so now we're we're over here in what are called the transition metals. Let's see, uh, scandium, I would say, well, it looks just like argon, plus two electrons in that 4S plus one electron in that in that 3D because uh, because uh, scandium is has 21 electrons.